it's time to take Kubernetes out of the box. He delivers cloud-native architecture supporting millions of users. Please welcome Kunal Parmar. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. This is my first Swamp Up, and this is an amazing audience. My name is Kunal Parmar, and I'm an engineering manager at Box. I lead the platform as a service and the observability teams at Box. And my team's mission is basically to help Mo Box adopt microservices, DevOps, and Kubernetes so that we can accelerate our ideas to the market. I'm going to share with you our journey of adopting Kubernetes, what we learned through our experiences, and hope that you can apply some of these to your journey in your organization. Let me first start by what Box does. Our mission at Box is to power how the world works together. Businesses are going through a digital transformation so that they can move faster and be more agile. To be successful, businesses need to find a way to use the content that their employees create and be able to derive maximum value efficiently and effectively. That's where Box comes in. Box provides businesses with a way to store all their content in one place, make it accessible on any device, be able to share it inside your organization as well as outside your organization, and do it securely. And also apply intelligence on top of the content so that you can have, again, maximum value. And we do this by applying advanced ML and AI technologies on that content. All of Box's functionality is available through our APIs, which allows our users to be able to extend that functionality to meet their unique use cases. Today, Box is used by over 92,000 businesses around the world. We have customers of all sizes across a lot of industry types and around the world. Some of these are the most security, privacy, and compliance-minded businesses. And that puts a lot of emphasis on how we provide our software to them. We have hospitals that use Box as a way to power information sharing that's critical to performing surgeries. We have insurance companies that power their entire claims processing on top of the Box platform, and many more which use Box in mission-critical ways. Let me take you back a few years where we had a problem. Founded in 2005, Box was a monolithic PHP application and that had grown over time to millions of lines of code. The monolithic nature of our application led to us basically building very tightly coupled designs. And this tight coupling was coming in our way. It was resulting in us not being able to innovate as quickly as we wanted to. Bugs in one part of our application would require us to roll back the entire application. And with many, many engineers working on the same code base with millions of lines of code, bugs were not that uncommon. It was increasingly hard for us to ship features or even bug fixes on time. And so we looked out for a solution. And it was clear, microservices. Split your application into small, independent, loosely coupled services that have clear boundaries and APIs. Microservices would allow you to develop, design, deploy, and scale these pieces independently. It would also allow you to isolate your failures and provide higher overall reliability. And it also allows you to move faster because 
each microservice can, can make independent choices and use the best of breed that, that is current in the industry. Great. So off to the races we went. Oh. So we started building microservices. And, the, and we saw an immediate impact where some of the monolithic problems started to go away. And so we decided we want to go full ahead on building microservices. That exposed some new challenges for us. When Box started in 2005, cloud was not a thing. We deployed all our services in our data centers. Our infrastructure and processes were not built for microservices. Our infrastructure was configured using the standard configuration management systems, and they were largely managed by our operations team. Our developers did not have access to our infrastructure, especially in production. So anytime they wanted to make any change, they needed somebody from our ops teams to make those changes for them. Our infrastructure also did not have clear APIs. It was not very easy for us to know when we make a change using configuration management system on what servers is that change actually going to impact. And our configuration management system actually followed the mutable infrastructure paradigm. So when you take these two problems together, it started resulting in us in having large amounts of configuration drift in our servers and many outages. Our, our release processes were also built in a way, in the standard way that you know, was the best operating practice back in the day. We had the separation of duties between devs and ops. Devs were responsible for writing code, throw it over the wall, and then ops would take it from there, deploy it, monitor it, be on call for it. So of course, there's a healthy tension between dev and ops, and that was coming in our way as well. These challenges resulted in it, in it taking us up to six months to provision a new microservice. And, this was, and there was additional problems because once those developers had provisioned those microservices, there was a large amount of overhead in how we managed those microservices. And this was, a lot of this overhead was dealing with how you manage the infrastructure. Fast forward to today, our microservice provisioning time is down to days. Takes about three to four days for someone who's starting from scratch, who's never done this before, and usually less a couple of hours for someone who's done it before. That's a 90x improvement in how much time it takes for us to go from having an idea to having a microser uh, microservice up and running. And this is awesome. So how did we do this? This transformation for us was made possible by two key factors, the Kubernetes technology and the DevOps practices. Kubernetes helped us abstract away the infrastructure from our developers so they can easily configure their microservices and not be coupled to the infrastructure that they're running on. It provided consistency between dev staging, and production. What this all resulted in was that devs were spending more time writing code, writing business logic, and le spending less time dealing with infrastructure level stuff. DevOps practices were also very effective for us because it helped us remove the barriers between the dev and the ops teams. This allowed us to deploy changes rapidly and without compromising stability. And JFrog has been part of this transformation for us from an early stage. As we were adopting Kubernetes, we needed a way for us to store Docker images. Fortunately for us, we were already exploring Artifactory as, as the way to store artifacts at Box. And this was to, because our previous way of storing artifacts, we were having tons of issue with, issues with stability, with how we were deploying the on-prem systems, and just like the whole infrastructure problems with that. And Artifactory supported Docker very early on. 
So as we started going with Kubernetes, we actually started adopting Artifactory for all our Docker images as well. And this has been great for us. This is what our pipeline and, and the workflow looks like for developers at Box. Each microservice has its own separate code repository. When a developer makes a commit into the code repository, it triggers our CI system. The CI system then kicks off the build job, does all the tests, the unit tests, the integration tests, the functional tests, and it also does all the security scans. And if everything is looking great, it publishes the artifact to Artifactory. And once the artifact is available, our CD system kicks in. Our CD system takes that change and starts deploying that change iteratively through all our environments, starting from dev, moving to staging, and then to production. And the way it does that is by updating the image reference in our config repository. The config repository is the place where we store the, the Kubernetes configuration for all services that are running at Box. In our Kubernetes clusters, we have a service called the Cube Applier. A Cube Applier's job is to basically watch the config repo, and anytime something changes there, it pulls those changes and applies those changes to the Kubernetes API server. And then Kubernetes does this magic from there on. It has what the desired state of the service should be, and it starts working on reconciling the system from its current state to that desired state that was just checked in by our CD system. Cube Applier was a, a service that we built at Box, and it's actually now an open source project. This chart here shows the number of deployments per month that uh, across all the microservices that are running on Kubernetes at Box. We first deployed Kubernetes to production in early 2016, and we've seen a rapid growth in the number of deployments happening. Today, we have over 5,000 deployments happening on a monthly basis for all the services that are running on Kubernetes. And Artifactory has been able to keep up with our scale needs as we've gone along. We have over 14 package types, 8 terabytes of storage on Artifactory, across 458 repositories, and we do about 33 terabytes per month of data transfer for these deployments. When observing the teams that were adopting Kubernetes at Box, we immediately saw an uptick in the number of microservices released. There was clearly a huge demand that was sort of not, developers were not able to explore um, uh, in how to build software the right way using microservices. And this, and the, the platform that we were offering enabled them to be more productive and therefore make better architectural choices. Today, we have over 180 services that are running on Kubernetes. There are over 19,000 instances across these services. 60% of our stateless services are on Kubernetes at this point of time. So how do we get to this state? Let me share with you some of the principles and lessons from our journey. decompose the problem. One of the fun fundamental practices of good engineering is to decompose the problem. And we applied this to our journey of adopting Kubernetes. What does that look like? So we took our whole problem space, which was we have all of these services that we done here at Box, and we decompose that into stateless and stateful services. We saw that the highest ROI for us would be by first enabling stateless workloads to run on, on Kubernetes, because that's where most of the development was happening. Further, Kubernetes itself did not have as good support for stateful workload when we were starting. 
So we decided to focus our attention on stateless services. Next, we decompose that to, to, into new services being built and existing services that existed. Now, with existing services, those teams have already paid the tax to get up and running. They paid the six-month tax, and so there wasn't that much benefit that we saw on that side. Further, anything that's already running in production and taking production traffic usually carries higher risk. So we decided, well, let's, pro let's solve the problem for new microservices being developed. And then finally, we decomposed that further down into services that acted just as clients and services that also acted as servers. And this was important because the needs of these two different types of workloads help you further simplify the problem. Client-only services, for example, don't need you to have the capability to do service discovery for them or load balancing because they don't take any requests. So this decomposition really helped us to simplify the problem and start working on it iteratively. We started with a small problem, learned through our mistakes and failures, got comfortable operating in this new paradigm with Kubernetes and DevOps practices. And as we gained more confidence, we started to solve for more use cases. We started moving up this stack. Today, all new microservices at Box are built from the get-go on Kubernetes. And we've been actively moving all of our existing services over to Kubernetes as well. Leadership buy-in. Kubernetes and cloud native in general represents a big paradigm shift. It's easy to make the pitch of how Kubernetes solves a lot of problems because it does things the right way. But keep in mind that Kubernetes is still fairly young, about five years now. There aren't a lot of precedents in the industry that you can point to and go to your leadership and say, I'm going to adopt Kubernetes, and here's why. And for us, this problem was actually even more amplified because we adopted Kubernetes really early in its development. We actually adopted Kubernetes even before it was GA, and we were actually part of the community to get Kubernetes to being GA. And so we had to fight much more to get leadership buy-in in our journey. So if you are trying to do the same in your organization, I have some tips that hopefully can help you. Start with painting the big picture. Talk about the problems that exist in your organization and how Kubernetes can help solve those problems for you. Be aspirational. Then use all the hard work you've done in decomposing the problem and show your leadership how you're iteratively going to make progress through this journey, through solving these problems. And use that to ask for funding. Right? You ask for $100,000 and a month from a couple of teams, chances are you'll get it. But if you start big and go for the $5 million and many teams spending many months on this, this journey of adopting Kubernetes, chances are it's not, you're not, you're not going to get a lot of success from that. And as you iterate through the problem, you can keep going back and asking for a little more and a little more. And most importantly, Adopt a metric to show the business value that the, the investments are deriving. Now, it's important to note that it's OK for you to iterate on your metric as well. And let me give you an example. When we first started and we were focusing on the new microservices uh, problem, our metric was time to provision a new microservice. And once we had crossed the stage, where we had solved the problem for new microservices and, our, and we were working on migrating existing services over, we shifted our metric. And our metric became the amount of operational overhead that those service teams were facing not running on Kubernetes and how moving to Kubernetes would reduce their operational overhead so that they, ha they had more time to innovate on the business side of things. 
And today, where we are in a place where leadership is very comfortable and understands the value that Kubernetes offers to us, we just talk about adoption. I mean, like, all right, we need to move these services. It's going to drive our adoption to this percentage. GitOps. One of, this was one of the most sort of fundamental engineering choices we made that had a huge impact on our journey. This tweet here does a pretty good job in summarizing what GitOps means. The basic idea with GitOps is that you use Git as a single source of truth for your system. All changes to your system are made as Git commits. These could be changes made by devs, by ops, or even by bots. And this is really important because with Git commits, now you have a very, very easy way to identify what impact your change is going to have. So all your changes are observable and verifiable. In one of my earlier slides, I showed a config repo. That is our source of truth. We have a versioned history of the state of any of our clusters from any point in time. And this has huge benefits for us, such as we can roll back to any state. We, we have a complete audit history of how the cluster got into its current state. And we can even recover from a disaster. I mean, on more than one occasion, we have accidentally had engineers completely wipe our dev cluster. And thanks to GitOps, we were able to bring it back in the matter of minutes. Meet your users where they are. To be successful in the transition to Kubernetes, you want to minimize the gap between how users operate in a Kubernetes world and how they operate today. Now, Kubernetes is going to force certain choices on you. For example, you have to use containers to package and deploy your software. But Kubernetes is incredibly powerful, and it gives you a lot of flexibility in a number of ways where you have the ability to make choices that are not forced upon you. And when you are making those choices, give more weightage to a choice that maintains how users operate today. Why? This will help you minimize the friction from those users in onboarding to this new system. Keep in mind, like your users are going to have to learn a number of new things. Kubernetes comes with its own set of um, practices and its own terminology, and they have to understand what those means. Reducing that will reduce that friction for them to want to come to your system. It will also reduce the risk in onboarding. People are already familiar with some of those technologies and how to use them. Your, your organization is probably familiar with some of those technologies and how to use them. And so when you adopt the same stuff, you, you're using something that's been hardened over time. Further, as you start looking at moving existing services, taking production traffic over to Kubernetes, this risk comes into, uh, will have a huge impact because it will prevent you from running into problems using newer technologies. And once you have your users on board, then you can work on migrating them to newer choices, newer architectures. And having seen the benefit, they will be more receptive to adopting those differences. Here are some examples of choices that you're going to make when you start to use Kubernetes. Service discovery, load balancing, monitoring, logging, secrets management, certificate management. I mean, this, this list is long. And for all of these choices, think about what your current experience is and use the flexibility that Kubernetes offers to see if you can incorporate the existing way of doing this in your Kubernetes architecture. Focus on adoption. When you're introducing a new technology in your organization, such as Kubernetes, you should treat that as a product. It just so happens that your customers are sitting right next to you. 
And for any product to be successful, you need to be focused on adoption. In his book, Crossing the Chasm, Jeffrey Moore, uh, Jeffrey Moore introduces the idea of the chasm. See, the idea is when you launch a new product, you're going to have people who are extremely excited to adopt newer technologies. And they will come and use your product. Once you get past that wave, though, and in order to, for, for you to be successful in making Kubernetes mainstream, you have to be able to cross that chasm. And having a consistent focus on adoption is going to help you cross that chasm. So when you introduce Kubernetes in your organization, find some of your early adopters and, and partner with them and find a way to make them super successful. Make their success be your mission. Later, when you go to other teams and you ask them to come adopt Kubernetes, or you go to your leadership and ask for more funding or resources, those early adopters who've been super successful are going to be your evangelists. They will help you be successful in getting what you're asking for. Have a driver that is responsible for driving adoption in your organization. Once you've crossed the chasm, you don't want to stop. You want to have someone who's consistently working on how do you get this product all the way through in your organization. The driver's role should really be to proactively reach out and find which teams should be onboarding, understand what their needs are, you know, partner with them and set up a story that will help them be successful. Do retrospectives when you're done with your onboardings and apply those learnings to future um, onboardings as well. This will ultimately help you be successful and help you cross over to a place where Kubernetes might become the de facto way to do stuff. Finally, I want to take a few minutes to talk about where we are headed. Kubernetes scaling up. So we've had a lot of investment in Kubernetes, and we're going to continue investing in scaling that up. Starting with adoption, 60% of our stateless workload is running on Kubernetes, and we want to drive that all the way to 100%. At some point, we'll also start looking at stateful workload and see how we can bring the benefits of Kubernetes to running stateful workload. Upgrades. One of the best things about, the Kubernetes uh, about Kubernetes is the community around it. And this community moves at an incredible pace. Keeping up with this pace of innovation has been hard. And the community recognizes this. There's actually a, 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 a working group in place whose focus is to bring a long-term support release for Kubernetes. So, while we keep an eye out for how they are working, we are also looking at how to improve our practices for upgrades and make them more seamless. Multi-cluster. Pretty much all of our workloads running on Kubernetes are actually run across multiple clusters in our different data centers that are in different regions in the world. Today, the onus is on our service owners to go run their services across these multiple clusters. This is unnecessary complexity that every service owner has to deal with. Ideally, we would like to raise our abstraction to a point where service owners don't care about the infrastructure even more. We want them to just give us their package, give us the configuration for the package, and let our platform take care of figuring out how to run that service in what clusters, in what regions, and what have you. And hybrid cloud. We are seeing an increased focus from our customers around data residency, around privacy. In order to meet these demands, we are running our services in various regions in the world and we are using public cloud in order to stand up in those regions. The service owners who run their services in these 
So in, this diff in, in the public cloud, have to deal with the differences between how to operate in the public cloud and how to operate on-prem, and they're completely different. Kubernetes was built from the day up to take care of those differences for them, and we are looking to bring that as we make our platform also support running services in the public cloud. So that way, we'll have one hybrid cloud setup that's completely abstracted away by Kubernetes. Zero trust. We are seeing an increase in the number of data breaches. The traditional security model has been to trust everything that's running in your corporate network and not trust anything that's running outside of it. This has resulted in an increase in the number of breaches because hackers have been able to get past in those secure parameters. And once inside, they can easily move through the various systems. And so the severity of these incidents have become really, really high. Zero trust refers to the model of security where you don't trust anything. It doesn't matter. Where it, you, you can't use the network identity of a workload to, fig, to decide whether it's secure or not. You want to make those choices for every request that your system gets, no matter where it comes from. And we want to move closer and closer to this model. And we are well positioned to make some of, uh, to use some of the choices we've made to get there. So as you know, we, we use Artifactory to store all of our artifacts in one place. X-Ray was built on top of this, and X-Ray provides the ability to be able to scan those artifacts that, are, that you're going to be running in production. And so we want to use X-Ray to start not like scanning all the artifacts so that we're not just looking at securing what's running in production, but we start very early from the build stage to identify if the things that we are about to package and run have any vulnerabilities and stop them from even being built before they run in, in, our, uh, uh, in our production clusters. Another technology that we are super excited about is Service Mesh. So Service Mesh gives you a lot of benefits with respect to observability, with respect to taking further complexity away from the infrastructure, but it also gives you a lot of benefits on security. With Service Mesh, we can start upgrading our security posture, where by default, you have your, your Service Mesh that's enforcing the security uh, that you need when requests are flowing through your systems. So that's all I had. Thank you for letting me share our journey and learnings from this experience. I look forward to hearing from you guys on how your journey is going with Kubernetes. Thank you.